Hello, I'm Brian Smith of the Oxford Coalition for Social Justice, and I'm a member of the Ontario Health Coalition. Welcome to this event. I'd like to recognize firstly our hosts here, the Southgate Centre, and the First Nations who knew these lands long before my ancestors came. We're here as part of an Ontario-wide tour with this new report on long-term care in Ontario that's been put together by the Ontario Health Coalition. It's a report that's based on lots of data across Ontario, but which heard from people in Oxford County on multiple occasions in hearings, by phone, and by letter. I'll outline the broad issues identified in the report and I, I introduce the speakers who are following me, who will be giving some local examples and their personal experience. They'll speak to the themes identified. Afterwards, we'll invite any questions that you might want to ask. In recent years, the Health Coalition has heard daily complaints about the serious problems in Ontario's long-term health care sector. Almost 80,000 people live in long-term care in Ontario. Long-term care homes is the term that's used for private nursing homes, nonprofits, and municipally owned ones as well. We're not talking about retirement homes here. They're a different thing and they are unregulated. People call the coalition because a family member who lives in a home has been hurt, injured, and they're concerned about what's happening. Sometimes they send a picture of their loved one covered in bruises. Sometimes they call because they're being forced out of the hospital and there is nowhere to go. They need to find a half decent place for a loved one and they can't. People stop me in other places to tell me about their grief at the sudden and unexplained loss of a loved one. Staff from long-term homes tell us that they're working short-shifted every single day and don't have enough time to tend to the basic daily needs of those people in their care. Health professionals tell us that the rates of injury have skyrocketed as staff are kicked or punched or grabbed or pushed or shoved by patients with dementia or other complex conditions. The Health Coalition was inspired by these accounts of wor worsening conditions in long-term homes to look at what is happening, to gather the evidence and to shine a spotlight on this issue that's so important to so many thousands of people. In other parts of medicine, we talk about who are the inflicted and who are the affected. Everybody is affected by what happens in long-term care homes because we all have a friend, we all have a family member, we all know someone who has a family member who needs long-term care. Many families are affected by this. What was found by the Ontario Health Coalition was shocking and is unacceptable. If care for the frail and the vulnerable is a measure of our humanity and our compassion, then we failed. We hope that this report will serve as a wake-up call so that issues can no longer be ignored by decision makers. Here's what we found. The Ontario long-term care homes have a rate of homicide that's seven times higher than that of the largest cities in the country. It's higher than virtually anywhere else in our society with the possible exception of the Middlesex Elgin Detention Centre. It's unacceptable that an environment where we place people who are in need of care is so dangerous. Homicide could sound a little sensationalist. It's not intended to be that way. What we're trying to ind indicate is how extreme the situation is here and hope that people will want to have action taken rather than be scared off action. The Ontario coroner has flagged in his annual reports for the past five years that this is a serious issue, that policymakers should be paying attention, and they have yet to do so. This reveals that we have a problem in long-term care in Ontario and that the twin issues of inadequate care and of violence that's escalated are things that we have to do something about because we've been hearing about them from families, residents and care workers. The research uses the government's own statistics and those are the long-term care home operators. So in fact, this is the government's data. This is data that the care operators in those private facilities are willing to share with the government when they're asked to do so. Ontario has extraordinary levels of occupancy and acuity. That's the heaviness and the complexity of care in the needs of the residents. Access to care is poor. 
We have 80,000 people in Ontario already in long-term care homes, but 33,000 are waiting for a placement. Add those populations together, you have the population of Oxford County. Wait lists are larger than an entire small town. Wait lists are longer in rural settings. For equity-seeking groups, they're even worse. Appropriate care is very poor for them. In fact, Ontario rates second last in the country in terms of long-term care beds per capita. Once people can get into long-term care, the actual levels of care are major problems too. The care levels are too low to meet the basic safety requirements and our research shows that the care levels have actually been declining. Acuity, or the heaviness, the number of problems each patient has of the residents, has soared in Ontario as governments have cut hospital beds, pushing people out of hospitals and into long-term care facilities, which are then acting as if they were actually hospitals. In no other province and in very few countries do we have so few hospital beds as in Ontario. The offloading is part of the problem, and part of the problem is the chronic care that's going into long-term care facilities, where the funding is approximately a third of what it would be for appropriate um, hospital care. Patients have been moved out to reduce costs at expense of them and of their families. There's no question that today's long-term care homes are the chronic care and psychogeriatric care hospitals of yesterday. Psychogeriatric care is the kind of care delivered to people with Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia, or people who have come with kinds of psychological illnesses already. We've looked at every measure of acuity for residents, and we found that the complexity of residents and their need for care has increased year after year. We looked at the hands-on care being offered to residents, and what we found is those levels have not kept pace. In fact, they have been in consistent decline over the years, meaning that heavier care patients are getting less care. For families who can afford it, they can spend tens of thousands of dollars per annum on extra care. I heard this morning from someone about um, a private long-term care facility where the family had put someone in the care and they had to hire outside care to come in and assist. I heard of somebody who had put a family member in long-term care this morning and has to go in to instruct the staff in how to do the life-saving devices that are necessary for that person. And while there, realizes that there are other people who are needing care in the wing as well and it's offering assistance to them. There are problems, and the problems are wor worse when you have violence involved. Violence in long-term care is a significant issue. Ontario has 27 reported deaths in long-term care from homicide. There are another two that the coroner said should have been in his list when he did that report. It's increased as the level of complexity of care has, has increased. It's increased as the number of people um, with psychogeriatric conditions has increased in, in those homes. We cannot tolerate this to, to continue. In for-profit, private long-term care, we have a significant number of problems. We have a promise for Ontario that will in fact get 15,000 new beds for long-term care. That sounds like a great thing, unless you're one of the remaining um, 18,000 people who won't get one of those placements. There are 33,000 people waiting for those placements. They're offering those extra uh, 15,000 beds over the next five years. How long will those people have to wait who are waiting for highly acute care? Um, when in the 1990s, the Harris government was in power, they closed many chronic care beds and hospitals and reduced that capacity. That pushed people out into the long-term care facilities. The government right now is talking about the possibilities for privatization in the health sector and particularly in long-term care. That's worrisome. It is not in the public's interest. Um, I want to introduce to you the first of my guests, someone who has been working in the field of long-term care, a PSW, Melissa Holden. Thank you, Brian. Residents in Ontario long-term care homes are entitled to a minimum standard of care to provide them with an acceptable level of dignity and respect. Shortly after assuming office, the Harris government abolished the minimum standard of care and the level of care has continued to slide ever since. We are currently sitting at an average of 1.3 to 1.9 hours of care per resident per day. 
This 1.3 to 1.9 hours of care speaks to moments of care spread out in a 24-hour period, like a quick conversation, a toilet visit, or a briskly fed meal. This complacency of our government leaders towards the care needs of our most vulnerable citizens leaves a noticeable gap in basic care needs, including, but not limited to, incontinence care and emotional needs. The staffing crisis in Ontario for PSWs is at a critical level. Insufficient staffing leaves the frontline staff feeling burnt out and discouraged while depending on their natural instinct and dedication to provide the residents with the care they need and deserve through their own selfless actions to complete the care requirements involving missed breaks, coming in early, staying late, and always with the threat or fear of discipline for not completing their assigned tasks on time or at all. Staff feel overwhelmed and immense pressure to problem solve and meet job descriptions. Residents admitted with six plus formal diagnoses such as dementia and acquired brain injuries is all too commonplace and is growing at a rate of 4.8% in long-term care homes. Long-term care homes are the chronic care and psychogeriatric care hospitals of the past. Even with the increase in acuity and care needs, the staffing levels have continued to decrease. We need to institute a minimum standard of care hours at four hours per care per resident per day to improve quality and delivery of care. Staffing shortages and workload lead to many homes working short on a regular basis, all while increasing the risk to staff and the residents. The lack of a minimum standard of care in long-term care is a contrib contributing factor in the increase of the violence we are seeing in the media presently. On a daily basis, staff are kicked, punched, scratched, choked, slapped, bitten, spit and screamed at, at times exposed to name calling, sexual aggression or comments, and racial slurs. 99% of these incidents go unreported as they are considered to be, by our employers, the culture in long-term care and an inherent part of our job. Job burnout is on the rise and the government has failed to recognize the implications of this level of stress. Violence with residents will only increase with these aforementioned statistics. More than half of long-term care residents have dementia and nearly half of those are aggressive. Studies show that 90% of employees have been threatened and 75% of those people have been assaulted this year. The risk is also present for residents living in these bleak conditions as there is insufficient staffing to prevent resident on resident attacks. At most times there is one staff for 30 plus residents. Thanks to an aging population, these numbers and incidents will only increase. This is unacceptable and needs to be addressed as the crisis it is. Thanks, Melissa. Um, when you were talking, it recalled the story of my daughter as a student helper in a long-term care home and describing how on a nightly basis she would be hit, she would be slapped, she would be screamed at by some of the patients and how she thought it was absolutely the most terrible thing she'd ever witnessed. And she did promise to my wife that she would never put her there. Um, she's still deciding about me, she said. <laughs> Our second guest is Tim, um, who's a bit of an anomaly in the system. In fact, he tells me that he was nicknamed the anomaly. Um, and like somebody I heard from this morning as well, um, is somebody who ended up in long-term care earlier in life. So long-term care is not restricted to people who are older or older than I am. Um, but is also something that people find themselves in in other circumstances. So Tim has first-hand experience of what it's like to be um, a person who's in long-term care and who finds himself in a circumstance where there are very few people like yourself. Tim, there are very few people like you. Join us and please uh, tell us a bit of your story. Thanks, Ryan. Um, in 2013, June of 2013, I was in a severe car accident and ended up in the hospital for four months. For about a month and a half of that, I was in the complex care ward at the Woodstock Hospital, and I actually had a lot of uh, ward mates that were just waiting on a long-term care bed. One individual in particular would come wandering into everyone's rooms and start to pull, try to pull them out of bed. And at that point, I wasn't allowed to walk, so that actually really scared me when she was pulling out my arm. Realistically, she wasn't strong enough to do it. Didn't matter. Though there was a large number of percentage of that ward that 
should have been in a long-term care facility because they didn't have but they did there was no beds for them they didn't have the wherewithal to live on their own they couldn't be left on their own so they had to be somewhere so they though they were paying for the somewhat for the bed in the hospital from what i understand they shouldn't have been there um, i was pretty much the i was the youngest person in that ward which made it really awkward to try to interact with anybody after i got out of the hospital i actually went to a private care facility uh, in woodstock and though the staff was quite good i was the youngest person there by over 30 years it makes it rather hard to interact with people when there's so much of an age gap. They, most of the people there were wonderful staff and the residents. Um, but my, my natural inclination is to be up later. I was starting to get going when 90% of the clients were already in bed sleeping. So I had no one to really to interact with when I was ready to do something. There's also the f aspect of not enough care, w even within the private facilities. You have the ability to have a shower once a week unless you pay extra for it. Um, laundry once a week unless you pay extra for it. Um, you don't have the interaction with people that you need unless you're of that age group. Realistically, with the severity of the injuries I received from in my car accident, I will probably be looking at a long-term care facility in my younger years versus what some, a healthy individual would. But that means I will be younger than most people who will be in there. And I will fall into, I'm already in a constant state of depression because of my injuries it won't get better in a facility where they continue to make cuts. When I was in the hospital, even there was a, for an, a period of time, I actually got told by one of the nurses that the, uh, op, the administration office had said that ward was using too many urinals. So we had to keep reusing them. They were the, press paper urinal. So after once or twice, how are they? Are they going to start falling apart? Now, it wasn't the most comfortable thing to think that I might might have had to use it and they would fall apart while I was using them. Fortunately, they did not. But some of them were four or five days old. Yeah, and that's just not right. Thank you, Tim, for sharing your story. Thanks so much to Tim for that. Um, Tim is giving us an example of what it likes to be different by age than other people, but we know it's very different for people, for instance, who are suffering dementia, whose first language was other than English and finds themselves in a facility. And we have populations here in, in Woodstock where um, the ages are, in fact, or the languages are in fact different in the background of people and that can cause some some problems for people um, it's also a problem in the, the lgbtq um, and twin-spirited community as well to be in a, a long-term care facility and not have appropriate care and um, it can be as basic as if somebody coming from a particular ethno um, cultural background and never having food that resembles the foods they had okay um, I'm told that much of what's served in long-term care facilities doesn't resemble food anyway um, but um, that we can probably get some experts to talk about some more. So what we'll do now is we'll take a few questions from people in the room. At the end, I'll just do a bit of a wrap up um, and pull a few of the recommendations of the report out again. Um, I will mention that this topic is a topic that is not new to us, that there is news um, today um, of a facility that had a fire in it and where those patients, 40 of them, were moved, where some are in hospital and feel very sad about that and about the people who were injured, including a firefighter who went in to rescue. Um, and know that there is a significant problem um, and how and where those people will be accommodated while that facility is then cleaned and the air is cleaned and the windows are repaired is a good question. Um, so questions from uh, folks in the audience and those people who are lurking at the door should work their way in the doorway at least. 
So, yes, Peter, I'll repeat your question back so everybody can hear. Hey, um, one thing you brought up was unregulated. How, can you uh, elaborate on more of it? what you mean by unregulated? Okay, so uh, currently retirement homes um, do not have to meet the same um, standards that long-term care homes would meet. Currently, I say, because there's a movement in the um, private long-term care facility network um, to have inspections removed so that they, in fact, would never be inspected. Um, that inspection data is the kind of data that provides the government with the knowledge about what's happening in the system, provides the public with solid data about what's happening, and what should be happening for the people that they entrust in those uh, institutions. So if those inspections disappear, our way to, ha to know about it will disappear, and therefore politicians will have no way to know what needs to be done or that something should be done. So that's the problem with regulation in, in this um, area. The other problem with regulation, I guess, in a sense is, and it's not really regulation, but I'll elaborate on it now because you let me speak, um, or I chose to speak, um, is that um, Ontario is, in fact, the province with the, with the highest number of private long-term care facilities. And what you have to know about private long-term care facilities is that their goal is profit. So they get the same allocation as a church-run one or a community-funded one or a municipally-funded one, but immediately they have to look for some profit out of that money. So obviously, they have less money to spend by 15% on the care of their patients. So there needs to be a regulation that obliges everybody to use the money that's dedicated to frontline care, to care and service for our people in long-term homes, um, to be spent on them. Um, there needs to be a regulation or an incentive to, in fact, go above that, which I know that, for instance, our municipal facilities do. There is a municipal contribution on top of the provincial contribution so that those places might be a place of first choice if you were going to be in a, in a long-term care facility. You would follow that maybe with a place that is run by a community group or by a, a faith group. Um, then you might think about, well, I actually have heard of that family. They're long-term residents in our area, and they own a facility. So I, maybe I'll go to their facility. By far, the worst care is provided by the, the chains that are frequently multinational um, and that really don't have any investment in heart in our community. Other questions? Yes? Perhaps you could... Uh let us know what steps uh, us as uh, community members could take to um, put pressure on our um, municipal, provincial, and federal governments to assist in the uh, advancement of care for uh, uh, some of our uh, communities most uh, vulnerable. Yes, well, I mean, in order to get our municipal governments, our provincial governments, and our federal governments um, involved, um, we have to make sure that they know. So that would mean the first step would be make sure that um, any attempt to take away the inspection service is blocked and that we raise our voices about that and make sure that the province that gets to determine that knows about that. In terms of a municipal government, I would suggest that um, those people who have decided they're going to go in and provide additional care in those facilities should be logging or blogging about those things and should be reporting them directly to those people, saying, I went in and I saw not only was the person I went to visit in need of some comfort and some care and some friendship time, but there are other people in the room who didn't have water provided to them and I provided them water. So you need to inform them that those things are going. I think we need to constantly be reminding the politicians to do what I'm sure they've said they would do, which is take care of all the things that need to be done. So I would suggest um, that if you're talking about um, at a provincial level, and most of the decisions about um, long-term care are made provincially here, I would suggest that people go and have a conversation with our local MPP, Ernie Hardiman. Um, for a couple of reasons. One is he's available in the constituency on Friday um, and he has times available for people to talk to him. I would go and talk to him about my personal story. Say, this is what I experience at work. This is what I experience when I visit someone. This is what I experience when I needed long-term care. And make sure that he has a good grasp of what it means to people that live here because he represents us here. Um, we have an advantage of actually having a cabinet minister here as well. And so I think if we impress him with those stories, he could have a conversation with his colleague who's in charge of health or around the cabinet table. 
Um, and he could then impress on them that people in rural Ontario are seriously concerned about health outcomes and long-term care being one of them. Rural Ontario has poorer health than other parts of the province, largely because we have less access to it. So I think we could be having those conversations with them all the time, individually and collectively. And I think that we might very well want to get together in groups that might be called things like the Oxford Coalition for Social Justice and have visits with some of these people. Or um, get together with some of the people you work with and say, I share this on behalf of multiple of my colleagues. Or talk about it with some of your neighbors and friends and say, these are the issues that we're all facing. I think we need to all go have a sit down with our local politicians municipally and encourage them to continue the support they're giving to long-term care here, um, to sit down with our provincial politicians and in encourage them to change the focus of long-term care in this province. There's a significant risk that they will privatize more. We know from the data that private care is less care. They can't let that happen. We also know that this is the province that has the least levels of care in Canada, with the possible exception of Newfoundland. And Newfoundland and Labrador is a special case because so much of their population is migrant between the oil patch and industry and back. So it's really hard to gather data and really hard to gather data outside of Goose Bay, Labrador, when you're trying to talk to other Labradorians. So we know that our care level is lower than that of Slovenia is lower that of Lithuania, is lower that of Turkey, which many people consider a developing country. Um, and that's on a national scale, knowing that provinces are above us. So it's clear that our federal politicians have a role in this as well, and that we should be having those conversations with them as well. Um, I would think that it's about 18 months from now that they're going to act um, very, very interested in, in you and in the things that you want to bring up to them because there's a federal election coming. But I've heard it said that it's very wise to have those conversations early with them. So it's already in their ear as they're thinking about what will be the things they commit to, which I would say is probably more important than promises, the things they will commit to doing when they're in office. So I suggest that we do everything we can, every time we can, to make sure that all those people who are decision makers are aware, and then also to hold them to those promises. So you go and have a conversation with them, and you say to them, here are some things I want you to know about care. And they say, right, right, they need to be fixed. And say, great, and I'm counting on you to do that. And I'm counting this number of days before I come back to you and ask you about what you've been able to do for us. Because um, the person in long-term care probably doesn't want to wait a year and a half for some changes to the quality of care they're receiving. Long answer to your short question. <laughs> yes? Are there different wait times depending on where you live? Yes, there are. Wait times vary depending on where you live significantly. Uh, the more you're in a rural area, the longer your wait times. Um, so that counts. The more that you derive from an ethnic population, the longer your wait times. So if you are somebody who's looking for a Polish-speaking facility, a French-speaking facility, um, because you have grown up in an Oriental culture and you're hoping to get those, the wait times lengthen. But rural Ontario largely waits longer. And the other people that wait longer are the friends that want to visit you. Because people in rural Ontario frequently get told, the next available bed is the other side of London. The next available bed is slightly beyond the northern borders of Oxford County. So the person who's in long-term care spends a lot of time waiting for somebody to come to visit them, especially on days like today when there's snow on the roads and there is no public transit that might get you there safely. Um, and they also, um, people spend a long time in their car to and fro rather than spending quality time with those people they love. So there are a number of ways to look at wait times. Um, and those wait times are really problematic for people who are in care or for people who are trying to deliver at least compassion, if not professional care, to friends, neighbors, acquaintances, et cetera. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, Peter, again. That's two questions. I'm counting. Um, you mentioned my Irish government, and it made me uh, wonder the current issue or uh, state of what you've been talking about, is it more or less become worse than my current government, or if the issue just uh, more or less 